We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today. Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hello, sports fans, and welcome to another edition of Yesterday Sports on the Sports History Network. Today, we're going to discuss the career of weightlifter Lee James. If you're not a fan of Olympic weightlifting or a lifter yourself, you're probably asking who Lee James is. It's not surprising that one would ask that question because Olympic weightlifting has never been a popular sport in America. Most USA lifters get very little recognition, and they don't receive compensation for the countless hours they devote to the sport. Such was the case with Lee James, who won the silver medal at the 1976 Olympic Games in Montreal. No American male lifter has won an Olympic medal since, except for Mario Martinez, who won a silver, and Guy Carlton, who won a bronze. They both medaled at the 1984 Games in Los Angeles. Not to diminish their accomplishment, but Soviet bloc countries boycotted the 1984 Games. I first met Lee in 1985 at a weightlifting clinic in York, Pennsylvania. Humble then as he is now, he's a modest man with a strong faith in God, who speaks little of his achievements. Because of his modesty, I was afraid he might say no when I asked if I could write an article about him and his accomplishments. Thankfully, he graciously granted my request. Born on October 31, 1953, Lee remembers watching all the movies about Samson as a child and reading about Samson's mighty strength in the Old Testament. He hoped one day that he could be as big and as powerful as Samson. Lee started weight training in 1969 at the age of 15. His source of inspiration was his lack of size. When he tried out for football at Westover High in Georgia, the coach told him he was so small that the team didn't have a uniform that would fit him. When Lee told his parents that he wanted to start weight training to gain weight and muscle, They purchased him a Bruce Randall 110-pound weight set for Christmas. Randall was former Mr. Universe. Later on, Lee started weight training at the YMCA in Albany, Georgia. Albany is where his family settled when Lee was 8 years old. It was his third stop. First, he lived in Gulfport, Mississippi, his birthplace. Later on, his family moved to Mobile, Alabama, and finally Gainesville, Georgia. With no one to coach him, he learned proper techniques from reading and studying photos in weightlifting magazines. He had plenty of great lifters to emulate, too. Tommy Kono, a gold medalist at the 1952 and 1956 Olympics, and Norm Shemansky, gold medalist at the 1952 Olympics, were the two he emulated most. He entered his first competition in December 1970 and managed to clean and jerk 255 pounds. At the Teenage Nationals in Georgia six months later, 
Lee clean and jerked 295 pounds. He weighed only 173 pounds. Along the way, Lee mastered the technique of the lifts. In Olympic weightlifting, the objective is to lift the weight from the floor to the overhead position. The snatch is completed in one motion. The other two lifts, the clean and jerk and the clean and press, are completed in two movements. Because he experienced lower back discomfort, Lee was relieved when the International Weightlifting Federation eliminated the press from competition shortly after the 1972 Olympics. Lee continued making tremendous progress for someone who had no prior experience with weightlifting. He didn't have a coach either. He attributes his progress to the fact that he comes from an athletic family. His father, Lee Sr., played football, baseball, and boxed in high school. His sister was an outstanding softball and tennis player. His brother was a good enough baseball player to be drafted by the Los Angeles Dodgers. Lee's lifting career was put on hold in 1972 when he joined the Army's 101st Airborne Division. He wasn't able to do any weight training during basic training, but once basics were over, he worked out at a gym in Port Campbell, Kentucky. It wasn't an ideal place to train, though. The barbells were bent, and climate control was non-existent. No heat in the winter, no air conditioning in the summer. But it was better than nothing, so Lee made the best of it. He purchased squat stands and a sheet of plywood to use as his lifting platform. A friend, Carl Dougherty, lent him an Olympic barbell to use. At that point, Lee was considering going to ranger school. Instead, he accepted the Army's offer to work temporary duty at the gym. Lee was finally able to compete again in October of 1973, and he picked up right where he left off, lifting 330 pounds in the clean and jerk. At another competition in January of 1974, he lifted 132.5 kilograms in the snatch, 292 pounds, and 165 and a half kilograms in the clean and jerk. That's 358 pounds. Those lifts qualified him to compete in the junior and senior nationals in the 82 and a half kilo weight class. That's roughly 182 pounds. He took second in the juniors and fourth in the seniors. Those performances qualified him to lift in international competitions. And he did compete in Germany, France, Spain, and England. His best snatch was 140 kilograms, 308 and a half pounds. And his best clean and jerk was 170 kilograms, roughly 375 pounds. It was at that point that Lee realized he might have what it takes to become an Olympian. His goal was to make the 1976 Olympic weightlifting team. Although still without a full-time coach, Lee received helpful advice from Dick Green and Marty Seifer. Soon after returning from his European trip, Lee was off to Mexico to compete in the Pan American Games. Lee placed second with a 135 kilogram, 297 and a half pound snatch, and a 165 kilogram, 363.7 pound clean and jerk. Next up was the World Championships in Manila, Philippines. He placed a respectable eighth, which wasn't bad considering this was Lee's first opportunity to compete in the World Championships. Later, in a local competition in Georgia in December, Lee snatched 315 pounds, which was the most he had done up to that point. One month later, in Philadelphia, he lifted his all-time best in the clean and jerk, 380 pounds. A month later, in Iowa, 
he set yet another personal record with a 695 pound total. That's both lifts combined. Then came the Senior Nationals in California in June of 1975. Lee snatched 142 and a half kilograms, 314 pounds, and clean and jerked 170 kilograms, roughly 375 pounds, the same as Pete Rawlock, his main competitor, had performed. But Lee had to settle for second place. The reason? The tiebreaker goes to the man that weighed in with a lighter body weight, and Rawlock was slightly lighter than Lee. Later that year, he once again competed in the Pan American Games and took first place with a 140 kilogram, 308 and a half pound snatch and a 175 kilogram, 386 pound clean and jerk. All the heavy training resulted in Lee gaining size and muscle, which meant he would move up to the next weight class, 90 kilograms, 198 and a half pounds. His first two competitions in that new weight class were Europe versus the Americas. The first competition took place in Toronto, and the second was in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, both taking place in November of 1975. His lifts were now up to 150 kilograms, 330 and a half pounds in the snatch and 185 kilograms, 408 pounds in the clean and jerk. Around that time, Lee and his family moved to York, Pennsylvania, a move made possible with help from weightlifting official Bob Christ. Christ wrote letters to the Army and the Pentagon on Lee's behalf, urging the Army to reassign Lee to York. There, Lee would be able to work out with many other top USA lifters. There was more to the move, too. Lee now had a coach in Dick Smith, and he enrolled at York College, where he studied marketing. In February, Lee began his attack at the American record in the snatch in the 90 kilo weight class with a lift of 157 and a half kilos roughly 347.2 pounds. The late Rick Holbrook had held the record previously with 155 kilograms. In June, at the 1976 Senior Nationals in Philadelphia, Lee took first place, beating out his good friend Phil Grapaldi with a 160 kilogram 352.7 pound snatch and a 195 kilogram, 430 pound clean and jerk. The 160 kilogram snatch broke the American record of 157 and a half that Lee had set back in February. The 1976 Nationals also served as a qualifier for the Olympics and both Lee and Grapaldi made the team. The Olympics are next in part two. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hello, sports fans, and welcome to another edition of Yesterday Sports on the Sports History Network. In part two of the Lee James story, we'll focus on Lee's big day at the Olympics. Lee hoped to become just the second American lifter to earn a medal since the 1968 Olympics in Mexico City, when super heavyweight Joe Dube won the bronze medal. No American weightlifter had medals at the 1972 Olympics in Munich. Lee arrived at the Olympic Village about a week before the competition. Lee remembers it clearly. Although I was experiencing some pain in my right knee, I was able to snatch 358 pounds in the training hall four days before the competition. I felt ready and confident, but I had to hold myself back a little bit in training 
because my adrenaline was sky high. I knew I needed to save some of it for the competition. At 22 years old, Lee was the youngest of the 19 competitors. The main competitors were David Riegert of the Soviet Union, who was the heavy favorite, Atanas Shapov of Bulgaria, and Lee's teammate, Phil Gopalvin. All three men were very proficient in the clean and jerk. Lee knew he had to do well in the snatch to have a chance at meddling. Riegert missed his opening snatch attempt, but made his next two and finished with 170 kilograms, 375 pounds. Lee, on the other hand, made all three of his lifts and finished with 165 kilograms, 364 pounds. Lee's 165 kilogram snatch was an Olympic record until Riegert snatched 170 just a few minutes later. Shapov made only his opening attempt at 155 kilos, 342 pounds. Rapaldi made his first two attempts, but missed his third, finishing with 150 kilos, 330 pounds. The lifter predicted to win the silver medal. Serhai Polterowski of the Soviet Union failed on all three attempts in the snatch thereby eliminating himself from the competition. Lee and Mikhail Brolyet of Switzerland were in the spot that Polterowski had vacated, dead even for second place, going into the clean and jerk portion of the competition. But then Lee put himself in jeopardy of not meddling when he missed his first clean and jerk attempt with 190 kilos, 419 pounds. Thankfully, he came back strong to make it on his second attempt, and that's when things got interesting. U.S. head coach Tommy Kono wanted Lee to take 195 kilograms, 430 pounds, for his third attempt, but Lee's coach, Dick Smith, felt that Lee needed 197.5 kilograms to stay in medal contention. It would be the most weight Lee had ever attempted in the clean and jerk. Kono relented and gave Lee the okay to take the 197 and a half. The last thing I remember that day, Lee recalls, is Smitty saying to me as I walked out to the platform, you need to be successful in this lift, Lee. If you miss it, you'll not only lose your chance for a medal, but I'll be in big trouble with Coach Kono. I felt confident that I could lift it, said Lee, and thankfully I did. Now all Lee could do was wait and see what the others were capable of lifting. The waiting was nerve-wracking. I was hopeful that I would at least win a bronze medal. Even if I tied for third, it would go in my favor, because the tiebreaker would go to the man with a lighter body weight. I was much lighter than the others. Finally, the waiting was over. Brolyet of Switzerland missed all three of his attempts with 197.5 kilos, eliminating himself from medal contention. Soviet lifter David Rieger made two of three lifts in the clean and jerk, finishing with 212.5 kilos. The Bulgarian Shapov made two of three, finishing with 205. American Phil Gopaldi also made 203, finishing with 205. After adding the two lifts together, the final results were as follows. First place, David Rieger, USSR, 382.5 kilos. Second place, Lee James, USA, 362.5 kilos. Third place, Atana Shapov, Bulgaria, 360 kilos. Fourth place went to Phil Grapaldi, USA, 355 kilos. Lee James had done it. He had won the silver medal for Team USA. The patriotic Lee was proud to have won a medal for his country. Here is Lee's response when I asked how it felt. 
I always believed that God had a destiny in mind for me. As I continued lifting and getting stronger, I began to think that this was the direction God was sending me in. I always prayed for the strength to push harder and harder. I felt incredibly blessed to have won the silver medal. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hello, sports fans, and welcome to another edition of Yesterday Sports on the Sports History Network. Here's the final segment of the Lee James story. We pick it up following a silver medal performance at the 1976 Olympics in Montreal. When they added the final votes to name the best USA lifter of 1976, Lee won 93% of the votes. In winning, Lee acknowledged that he could never have done it alone. Lee gave special thanks to John Turpak and Bob Christ for convincing the Army to allow him to train in York, Pennsylvania. Also, Bob Hoffman for the Hoffman Foundation Scholarship that allowed him to attend college while training, and the people of Albany, Georgia, his hometown, for always supporting him. He also thanked his coach and trainer, Dick Smith. Smitty was a great coach and a wonderful person, said Lee. He was kind of like a third parent to me, even though I already had terrific parents. Smitty would have me doing things that were not conventional. For instance, he would have me facing all different directions in training while doing the lifts. Smitty didn't want me to get used to always facing the same direction. He also didn't want me resting too long in between sets. The reason for that is if you fail to succeed on your first or second attempt, and you elect to attempt the same weight again, you are only allowed two minutes to get back out there and try it again. Another thing he would do, Lee continued, is that he'd sometimes have me practice taking big jumps and weight during training. His thinking was that you never know when you're going to have to take a daring increase during a competition to win a medal. In one competition, he had me take 330 pounds for my opening attempt on the snatch. That was a conservative opener, considering I had done 369 in training, but on my second attempt, he had me take 352. Most lifters only take a 5 kilo, 11 pound jump from first to second attempt. My third attempt was 167 and a half kilos, 369 pounds. That was an American record. A 17 and a half kilo increase from first to third attempt is very unusual, but I was used to that with Smitty as my coach. I felt training with Smitty was a supreme gift from God, that perhaps God had put Smitty and me together for a mutual purpose. Here's a sample of the training routine Lee was following at the time. He trained Monday through Friday, with Wednesday reserved for jumping drills and stretching, but no lifting. Interestingly, he did the actual competition lifts just once a week, although for many sets. Lee also did many pulls, once a week on snatch pulls and once a week on clean pulls. He also did strict form overhead presses once a week. Lee believed it was imperative to do extra lower back work as he employed both hyperextensions and the good morning exercise once a week. And Lee left nothing to chance when it came to leg strength. He squatted four times a week, twice on back squats and twice on front squats. He also did leg extensions four times a week. Lee didn't skip his ab work either. He did sit-ups four times a week. Unfortunately, 1977 didn't go quite according to plan. Lee started to experience pain in his right knee shortly after the Olympics. X-rays revealed the patella tendon was ripping off the kneecap, and Lee had to undergo knee surgery. 
Once recovered from the surgery, I started training again, said Lee, but the pain was too great to train heavy. That's when the doctor told Smitty that repairing the tendon didn't mean the cause of the problem had been fixed. Instead of being rounded where the tendon from the kneecap runs to the tibia, Lee's was more pointed, and it was also cutting through the patella tendon. That meant a second operation, which took place in late summer of 1977. The doctor took off some of the kneecap and rounded the rest. I asked Lee if he had any doubts or reservations about coming back after two knee operations. I believed that the adversity I had been through was to strengthen me mentally and physically. Even after the first two knee operations, I thought God had intended for me to do more. Still, many people wondered if Lee would ever be as good after not one, but two major knee operations. In February 1978, Lee put those doubts to rest. He was back in York, Pennsylvania in his first competition since the 1976 Olympics. And Lee served notice that he was not only back, but better than ever. He broke his American record in the snatch with a lift of 167 and a half kilos, 369 pounds. A month later, Lee participated in the Friendship Cup in Russia. And although he didn't lift his best, Lee still took second place. A few months later, Lee was at the 1978 Senior National Championships, where he easily won first place in the 198 pound weight class, with lifts of 352 pounds in the snatch and 430 pounds in the clean and jerk. There were only two lifters in the competition that totaled more than he did, and both of them were much larger men than Lee. He also won the coveted Best Lifter Trophy. Yet Lee walked away somewhat disappointed. I had snatched 375 pounds and clean and jerked 452 pounds in training just one week before the competition, he remembers. I was expecting to do those same weights at the Nationals. I took 352 from my opening snatch attempt and made it relatively easy. Smitty and I knew that lift would be enough to win first place in the snatch. So we went straight to 375 for my second attempt. Had he made the 375, it would have set an American record, breaking his old record of 369. Lee explains what happened. I had it locked out overhead, but as I stood up, I had to take a step forward. As I stepped forward, I slipped on some talcum powder, which caused me to lose my balance, and I had to drop the weight behind me. Lifters will often use talcum powder on the front of their thighs to reduce the bar's friction. Lee tried the 375 on his third attempt, and once again, he had it locked overhead, but this time he lost it forward. Then, Lee missed his opening attempt with 430 on the clean and jerk. He cleaned the weight without too much difficulty, but as he jerked the weight overhead, his back foot once again slipped on talcum powder. Lee took the same 430 on his second attempt and was successful. On his third attempt, he called for 452, and that would have broken the American record, but he was unable to rack the massive weight on his shoulders. He tried it again on a fourth attempt, but had the same outcome. Lifters are allowed a fourth attempt when attempting a record. It's also worth noting that Lee weighed in at 88.6 kilograms. He usually weighed in at the class limit of 90 kilograms. That's a three pound difference in body weight. Sadly, that was Lee's final competition. As I started training again for the world championships, I began to get severe pains in the knee, Lee explained. And this time, pain radiated to the top of the tibia. 
The tendon was peeling off the tibia from being hyper-stretched under heavy loads. To eliminate some of the tendon's hyper-stretching, the surgeon operated on the right hip to try to drop the quadriceps to compensate for the shortened patella tendon. But the surgery was pointless. It's not exactly the way I wanted to go out of the sport, but we don't always get to choose. Sadly, Lee's weightlifting career was over at the young age of 24 years old. When I couldn't compete any longer due to the knee issues, I was bitter for quite some time. I'm glad to say that as I look back now and think that perhaps it was for the best. President Jimmy Carter ruined a lot of people's Olympic dreams in 1980 with that boycott and I know I would have pushed myself extremely hard to be the best at those Olympics, only to be told we're not going. One can only speculate how much more Lee could have done if not for the bad knee. Lee believes he could have eventually snatched over 400 pounds. I for one think he's right. To some that may seem like a bold statement, but consider this. Up until February of 1976, the American snatch record stood at 341.7 pounds. Just six months later, Lee had it up to 363.7 pounds. He increased that record to 369 and came extremely close with 375 with a bad knee. Lee's American record total of 362.5 kilograms set at the 1976 Olympics held up until Kurt White totaled 365 in 1985. If you think that's impressive, hold on. His 167.5 kilo American snatch record set in February of 1978 still stands. Tom Gow equaled Lee in 1996, but Tom did the lift with slightly higher body weight. Not one to sit around feeling sorry for himself, in 1980 Lee took up karate. The main reason I took up karate is that my son Stephen, then seven years old, wanted to take lessons. I figured as long as I had to drive him back and forth for these lessons, I might as well join in. My son eventually lost interest, but I continued and earned a black belt. I did that for about three or four years, and it was gratifying. Then I got into cave diving for a while, which was a lot of fun too. Lee will be 69 years old in October. He worked in the insurance business for many years and is semi-retired today. I do some work as a handyman, and I enjoy woodworking, Lee said. I have a workshop in my basement. Lee and his wife, Lori, live in Raleigh, North Carolina, with their 20-year-old daughter, Abigail, while their 31-year-old daughter, Shannon, lives right down the road. 32-year-old son, Will, and his fiancée, Stephanie, also live in Raleigh. The oldest child, 50-year-old son Stephen, and his wife Tracy live in Georgia. Lee and Lori also have three granddaughters ranging from 6 to 15 years old and a 2-year-old grandson. It was a pleasure and honor to chronicle the story of one of America's great weightlifters and a man whom I admire enormously. He's Olympic champion Lee James. Hope you enjoyed the article and God bless. It was just another ordinary day in the offices of the Pittsburgh Guardian newspaper circa 1924. But for Marla Delft, assistant editor, everything was about to change. For she was about to discover the awesome attractiveness of Row 1 brand retro sports paraphernalia items thanks to Orville Mulligan, sports writer. And there it is. 
Wow, Orville, that's really the bee's knees. Isn't it just? A poster-sized replica of the actual 1909 World Series program cover. I can see that. But where did you get it? And where'd you get it framed? I ordered it from the Row 1 website, where over 6,000 items of sports memorabilia from the 1880s to the 1990s are available for reproduction in multiple sizes and in several different materials, with over a dozen styles of frame to choose from for prints like this. Well, I'm sure Mr. Delft would love to put up more of these in the office. But I'm equally as sure they're beyond this newspaper's budget. <laughs> Not at all, my dear Marla. See for yourself. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. Sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. Oh my, these are good prices. Oh, and look at this stuff. Oklahoma, Nebraska football. College basketball art. Michael Jordan items. And so Retro it was that Marla Delft discovered the spondiferous magic of Row 1 Sports Memorabilia Arts and Prints. You can, too, by visiting sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1. That's R-O-W number one today for access to the full Row 1 catalog of gallery prints and gifts like t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, telephone cases, coffee mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Act today for a 15% discount off all prints with coupon code SHN15 and 20% off all other items with coupon code SHN20 at checkout. And keep your dial locked to the Sports History Network for the exciting chronicles of the 1920 sports world in Orville Mulligan, sports writer, coming soon. Oh,